War with China by 2025 – that's the prediction made by the U.S. Air Force four-star General Mike Minihan in a memo sent to his subordinates. The leaked memo has caused shockwaves around the world, with the U.S. quickly backing down from the General's comments, stipulating that this does not represent what the rest of the U.S. higher-ups officially think. Yet, for years, the battle drums have been sounding louder and louder, to the point that while the U.S. may publicly say it's not preparing for war, its actions indicate that it's very much, in fact, preparing to fight China in the immediate future. Tensions with China have been simmering for two decades now. In 1995, a diplomatic incident kicked off what would become known as the Third Taiwan Strait Crisis, a turning point in China's relationship with the U.S. The crisis was kicked off by Taiwanese President Li Tanghui, who accepted an invitation by Cornell University to come to the U.S. and deliver a speech on the democratization of Taiwan. China saw the U.S.'s invitation of a Taiwanese president to speak officially about Taiwan's democracy as an endorsement of Taiwan independence. This deeply angered the Chinese Communist Party, who launched a series of missiles over Taiwan and into the ocean. For a moment, it looked as if the Chinese military would try to invade Taiwan, and the situation only de-escalated when the United States Navy sailed aircraft carriers through the Taiwan Strait in the greatest show of military power in the region since the Vietnam War. China was unable to challenge the might of the U.S. carrier battle groups and was forced to back down. Furious, China vowed to never be humiliated again and set about building the world's largest navy. Now the island of Taiwan is set to pit the U.S. and Chinese militaries against each other, with catastrophic global consequences. Officially, China considers Taiwan to be a breakaway province, and the civil war between the communists and the Chinese nationalists never officially ended. Instead, the nationalists fled to Taiwan and established the Republic of China, claiming to be the legitimate rulers over all of China. Lacking amphibious capabilities, the Chinese communists were forced to sit on the beach and shake their fists angrily at the island of Taiwan, 100 miles away from the Chinese shore. China is important to the world because the world likes money, and China has over a billion customers and potential factory workers who will make stuff for cheap. It's a win-win situation for everyone. You can get the Chinese to make your stuff for cheap, then turn around and sell it to them for 10 times what it cost you. This fundamental economic principle quickly made China an important trade partner to most of the world. And under threat of cutting off trade relations, China insisted that a recognition of Taiwan as independent would be tantamount to a declaration of war. Recognition of Taiwan's independence is seen as meddling in an internal Chinese affair, something the Chinese Communist Party will not allow to happen. Not wanting to upset all that sweet, sweet communist money that they were making, the world largely agreed for decades, leading to the current predicament of having one of the world's most successful democracies sitting right offshore of one of the world's most hostile dictatorships. For its part, China tried to sweet-talk Taiwan into retying the knot peacefully. It offered economic benefits, offered the protection of the mainland, which is weird when it's the mainland that Taiwan needs protection from. And when that didn't work, China, like any bad ex in a terrible breakup, started making up outright lies. It promised that if Taiwan rejoined, they could, like, totally keep their free and open democratic systems. Pinky swear. Just look at Hong Kong. One country, two systems. The lies were never really enticing to the Taiwanese population, probably because they weren't idiots. And Taiwanese opinion on reunification has remained historically low. It got even lower, however, when Hong Kong decided it wanted the Chinese Communist Party to actually stick to its promise of one country, two systems. And large parts of the quasi-independent city rebelled for months against mainland-inspired laws, specifically targeting politically dissident activity, making it easier for the CCP to arrest and jail democracy activists. In the end, the riots were put down and the rebellion in Hong Kong was suppressed. The mainland government tightened its grip on Hong Kong, jailing dissidents, censoring textbooks, and shattering any illusion of one country, two systems. A whopping 1.2% of the population fled the city in a massive exodus, serving as a warning to Taiwan. But what the Chinese President Xi Jinping can't have by playing nice, he'll take by force. Today, it's painfully obvious to the world that China is preparing for an invasion of Taiwan, growing its navy and specifically its amphibious capability year by year. In another year or two, it's believed by many in the U.S. military that China will have the needed transport capability to invade the island. And if it wins, that's bad news for the world, which is why the U.S. can't allow it to happen. First, China taking over Taiwan would endanger the sovereignty of every nation on Earth, no matter how far from the South Pacific they may be. Taiwan today is known for two things, being the proclaimed legitimate government of China and its semiconductors. Decades ago, as the computer revolution took the world by storm, Taiwan saw an opportunity to become a global player and secure its own freedom, both. 
With labor cheaper than in Western nations, Taiwan had an economic edge when it came to manufacturing. This edge was leveraged with the technical expertise of its population to start making semiconductors. After decades, Taiwan is now the world's chief producer of semiconductors. It makes 60% of the world's semiconductors and over 90% of the most advanced ones used in cutting-edge technology and military weapons. Without an independent Taiwan, the U.S. military would take years to resource their microchips, leaving the U.S. extremely vulnerable to attack and putting it a decade or more behind in research and development. These chips are so important that they are in effect an insurance policy for the island nation, because if Taiwan fell to China, China would now have a near monopoly on advanced electronics. Any nation not towing the Chinese Communist Party line would be threatened with embargo, which by itself would be enough to crash a national economy. An actual chip embargo would gut it and send it reeling back to the 1940s. Hey kids, do you like going to see western movies? Do you like playing Resident Evil on your game console? Do you like the freedom of the press, assembly, and having unlimited gaming time? Well, guess what? President Xi doesn't like any of those things. And if he has all the semiconductors, what President Xi doesn't like is now what you don't like. So if you don't want to be limited by the state to three hours of gaming time a week, yes, we said three a week, it's time to start caring about Taiwanese independence. The Chinese Communist Party has explicitly stated that its goal is to upend the US-led global order. It wishes to challenge the global status quo as set by Western democracies who, despite their many flaws, actively strive to expand human rights and freedoms around the globe. This is a direct threat to the authoritarian rule of President Xi and the CCP. And when China looks around today, they see a lot of unfriendly faces around them. Turns out people like democracy and not having dictators. Who knew? That's why China must use the leverage provided by Taiwan's economy to directly influence the world. The CCP has already exported mass surveillance technology to small authoritarian nations around the globe, especially in the global south, which has largely been ignored by the West. It seeks to reshape the world in its own image so as to chip away at American and European power and to ensure the security of its own Communist Party. It's a remix of the early Cold War, when the Soviet Union believed the only way to ensure national survival against the capitalist West was to export communism everywhere. That's why for decades if you went into a bathroom and turned off all the lights, then whispered, the workers shall own the means of production. Into a mirror three times, the bloody ghost of Joseph Stalin would appear and hand you an AK-47 in a T-54 tank. The Soviets made the AK-47 the most popular assault rifle in the world and a cultural icon because they gave it to everyone who identified with communism free of charge. Today the Chinese are doing the same, though this time it's with domestic surveillance technology and maybe not free but certainly cheap. Today it's not about spreading communism but about spreading authoritarianism and squashing down liberal democratic ideals. But the taking of Taiwan won't just leave China with its finger two knuckles deep in everyone's cherry pie. It'll also deliver a body blow to the West's greatest strength. At the end of the Second World War, the West had a brilliant idea. What if we literally never do this shit again? Thus, the US began carefully constructing a system of partnerships and alliances that span the world, with nuclear proliferation a massive concern not just for the US but the Soviets as well. America's intricate web of alliances, partnerships, dalliances, and one-night stands grew even larger, and the US combined political and economic pressure along with promises of military aid to deter other nations from developing their own nukes. The famous American nuclear umbrella stretched to cover every member of NATO as well as Japan, Australia, and South Korea. Cold War alliances and partnerships have become the very security bedrock of the modern world, with much of it turning to U.S. security guarantees to keep the peace. Without the promise of U.S. military aid, countries around the world would probably do much as they've done for all of history, and engage in arms races and military competition with each other. Without U.S. security guarantees to Saudi Arabia, for instance, something Americans have grown to resent after the Crown Prince murdered an American journalist, Iran and the Kingdom would have gone to war against each other many years years ago, disrupting global oil trade and upending the world economy. If that carefully built network were to suddenly receive a massive body blow, the current global order would collapse in on itself, and this is why China needs to take Taiwan. The US maintains a policy of ambiguity when it comes to defending Taiwan. Yet the quiet part was said out loud when President Biden repeatedly stated that he would defend Taiwan militarily against the CCP. This was hardly a revelation, as everyone knows the stakes are too high, but each statement by President Biden prompted China to call the US escalatory and inflammatory despite the fact that it's their missiles pointed at Taiwan, not America's, and they add more every day. 
A battle for Taiwan is not just a battle for the global semiconductor trade, but a battle for the legitimacy of the American government and military both on the world stage. Simply put, if the US cannot contain China and prevent or defeat an invasion of the island, then other regional partners and allies will begin to lose faith in their own partnership with the US. Slowly but surely, the effect will spread as nations now turn to new powers and new partnerships to guarantee their security. Meanwhile, bad actors would exploit US weaknesses to achieve their own agendas, sowing further international discord and chaos. And the worse the US loses, the more catastrophic the effect to the global order. Nations in the Pacific would feel especially vulnerable after a US failure to defend Taiwan. This would prompt one of two things. Some would seek to distance themselves from America and cozy up to the new regional superpower, China. After all, if China shows the world they can keep the US military locked out of the Pacific, then many nations would feel they have no option but to join the CCP club. Naturally, this would come at a cost for them, namely the slow erosion of their democratic systems in favor of a more authoritarian CCP model. The second possibility is the US loss would trigger a massive military buildup in the region. An arms race is never good, but it's especially bad when it's almost a guarantee that nations like South Korea and Japan, who have the technical expertise, would seek to arm themselves with nuclear weapons. If US conventional military power can't stop the People's Liberation Army, then there's no hope that any other nation's conventional military power could stop an invasion of their own country. South Korea would be especially pressured to pursue a nuclear agenda as quickly as possible. Not only is the nation very close to China, but its sworn enemy North Korea doesn't just have ambitions of reunification by force, it's also a nuclear power. It would be all but treasonous for the Republic of Korea president to not seek the nuclear option. It's not just in the US's interest but the world's that America is able to maintain faith in its ability to provide military superiority to any of its partners or allies. The alternative is an exponentially more dangerous world. Currently, the US and its allies find themselves the Obi-Wan to China's Anakin, as in they have the high ground. US military bases are strategically placed around what is known as the First Island Chain. This is a chain of islands that stretches from Japan to Taiwan and the Philippines, and from which the US and its allies can project firepower that ensures Chinese ships don't have access to the Pacific and beyond. Even more importantly, the US Navy and its ability to conduct global operations means that it can be deployed to two critical choke points, the Straits of Malacca and the Gulf of Oman. Both locations are natural choke points at which the US and allies could blockade China's seaborne trade. With over 60% of its trade being conducted via the sea, stopping the trade arteries feeding China's economy would cause an immediate market crash. Even more importantly though, the bulk of China's oil and petroleum products all come in via these two narrow choke points. Without this trade link, China would be limited to the very little oil it can produce domestically and what it can get from its partner Russia. Russia is an energy superpower, unfortunately for literally the entire world, but its ability to export oil to China is relatively limited, only to a few major pipelines. Many of these pipelines could be easily struck by the US from the Pacific with the use of submarines and land attack missiles, choking off the import of Russian oil to a trickle. China would be forced to ration its energy resources, dedicating many of them to keeping its military and military-industrial complex running. This would lead to a massive economic downturn, the likes of which the world hasn't seen since the World Wars, and civil unrest would pose an immediate risk to the CCP's hold in power. China's developed the world's largest navy in hopes of changing its own strategic quagmire, but without a sizable aircraft carrier fleet that can challenge the US's own, it remains unable to protect its own trade. And the news got even worse for China recently, with the Philippines opening up additional military airfields for use by the US Air Force and the Navy. For its part, the United States denies accusations that it's encircled China. If by we haven't encircled China militarily, the United States actually means we've only half encircled militarily, the most important half then technically they are correct. A brief glimpse at the general location of the US military bases in the region makes it clear that America is perfectly poised to trap Chinese forces inside China itself. And this is why Taiwan is so geographically important to the US, because in case of war, Taiwan is a crucial link in the first island chain that ensures no Chinese fleet can sail to the open sea without being welcomed by dozens of harpoon anti-ship missiles. The ocean is kind of important, even if fish poop in it. The open sea is an economic superhighway, and it's no coincidence that the vast majority of the world's goods travel by sea. Ocean trade is cheap and takes less energy per ton of good moved, which keeps prices down and profits up. Without control of the sea, no nation is truly independent, and its adversaries could always cut it off from the global economy.
If China is to become not just a regional power but a global superpower, it has to break the first island chain, and that means taking Taiwan. China's ambitions and the CCP's continued survival all depend on winning a war against the United States. That's exactly what it's been preparing to do for decades since the third Taiwan Strait and the humiliation of having U.S. carriers sail right off the coast of China. If war did break out between the two powers, it would affect the entire world. China is a major trading partner to basically the entire world, doing over $700 billion in trade with the EU alone. As much of this trade would now be passing through a war zone, and the US Navy would be blockading all Chinese trade, the entire world would suffer an economic recession. We've already seen the effects of the supply chain breaking down thanks to the COVID pandemic. This time, the supply chain would potentially be down for years, depending on how long the conflict raged. After Russia's invasion of Ukraine, many had seen the writing on the wall and started to work on diversifying their trade, or at least preparing for a disruption of Chinese trade. China has aggressively courted the EU economically, knowing that to win against the US it has to make its partners and allies hesitant to support it. Losing trade with China might be a massive enough financial hit to change the minds of many US partners and those nations stuck somewhere in the middle. However, the EU's response to a Russian invasion has made Chinese planners second-guess the continent's willingness to bear economic hardship. The Russian invasion has drawn immediate parallels to China's plan to reunify Taiwan by force, and many European countries have warned that they would support US sanctions against China if it began to seriously threaten an invasion. The invasion of Ukraine has forced Europe to decide which it likes more, a healthy economy or its self-professed love for liberal democratic values. So far, it's chosen to uphold its democratic values despite serious financial pain from sanctions against Russia. Today, Russia is vilified by the majority of the world. The nation's become an international pariah, and its economy is unwinding from the effects of extreme sanctions that only grow the longer its war against Ukraine rages. China has seen this as a direct parallel to how the world might react if it invades Taiwan, especially if it's the aggressor. And China would have to be the aggressor in any campaign to take Taiwan. If it wishes to succeed, it would have to attack the US military in the Pacific with a bolt onto the blue attack. The two nations' abilities to deliver catastrophic blows to each other's warfighting ability means that victory will heavily favor the side that can strike first. This incentivizes China to bear the burden of being a global villain and attacking US forces first, even if it inevitably uses a false flag attack to justify an invasion of Taiwan. China's only hope for victory is a rapid occupation and an end to hostilities, but it can't accomplish this without knocking the US military out of the Pacific. A bolt onto the blue attack would allow it to devastate US military forces in the region with long-range standoff attack weapons, cruise missiles, and ballistic weapons. In recent war games, China was able to destroy 90% of US military hardware in the opening days of the war if it struck first and had the element of surprise. This would risk turning China into a global pariah state, much like Russia. Yet, President Xi Jinping and the CCP itself have all but staked their legitimacy on the reunification of Taiwan. President Xi and the CCP have promised the nation, the world, that they are now a superpower. And now, over 1 billion Chinese people are looking at them and how they handle the rebellious Taiwan and the US military giant that protects it. War by 2025 might be all but inevitable. Now go check out China and Russia vs NATO or click this other video instead.